Well, it is a red leather day here at Arise News. We're all basking in the glow of being recognized for excellence in TV journalism. At a gala event this weekend, the New York Television Academy awarded Arise News an Emmy for our documentary, who headed up the documentary team, or our producer, rather, who headed up the documentary team, as well as one of the legendary players, Charlie Hoxie, from the early years of basketball. But first, let's take a look at Game Changers, how the Harlem Globetrotters battled racism. Constantly on the road, they took on any and all white teams willing to accept the challenge, routinely beating them. It's just that uh, we were better ball players, and we had a much better team. We are as good, if not better, than you are. You got more opportunities. We don't have those opportunities. We are better. And the only reason that we don't have those opportunities is that our skin is dark. Let's be a little bit uh, fair, and maybe that's kind of sitting here about the white players of that era. They were playing a different type of basketball. They did not have the jumping ability, the athleticism that a lot of the black players had. So they used what they had. They just couldn't do what the guys of color were able to do from the very, very, very beginning. Charlie Hoxie, Alan Weiss, welcome to Arise America. Thank you guys so much for being here. And let me also say congratulations uh, to our director of news, Alan Weiss, as well as to our owner, uh, Induka Obegbena, Julian Phillips, the host. And there's a whole list of people whose names deserve to be said that worked on this project. This has got to be exciting. It's very exciting. There's the golden girl. Congratulations Thank you very on much. this. And we'll uh, uh, talk a little bit about the evening in a second. But let's talk about this documentary. For for which you got this recognition. And Mr. Hoxley, I'm gonna to come to you in just a moment. Just stand by for a second. Alan, I want you to talk a little bit about why you were interested in doing this documentary. Well, it was a very interesting idea when it was presented to us, and that was that the, Gold, the Harlem Globetrotters of the 30s and 40s and 50s were really made up of two types of players. They were the showboaters that did those incredible dribbling and, and all sorts of tricks, but then there were those workhorses that were truly probably the best basketball players of their day. And those two players comprised the teams, but as the time went on, people forgot about the workhorses. So we wanted originally to do a story focusing on people like Hoxie, Carl Green, Andy Johnson to tell their story. But then it changed. When Ronald, when Donald, uh, Donald Sterling, the owner of the LA Clippers, came out with his comment about not wanting his girlfriend to bring people of color to the game, we went, wait a minute, how could that happen in a, in a you know, today in, in the NBA? So we went back and looked at the interviews, and we saw there was a lot of stuff that we hadn't first seen about the difficulty of dealing with racism all the way back to the beginning of the Gold Cross. And, and particularly in the time where the, in the heyday, if you will, of the Harlem Globetrotters, and we're, you know, as far back as the 40s, but certainly the 50s and, and 60s, when uh, civil unrest really came to a crescendo. Mr. Hoxley, let me come to you. Can you sort of take me back? You were in the Harlem Glo Globetrotters in the mid to late 50s. What was the experience as a player, but also as a black man, being a part of this team? Trials have always been like heroes to us. And, uh, you know, in fact, the first time I saw a basketball game, it was the Globetrotters playing. And that said I, to my late brother at that time, I was about 12 years old, I'm going to play with them someday. Mm -hmm. And he laughed, and then we all laughed uh, about it. But when I get, finally got the chance, uh, I, I, I've always loved traveling. And I, I love to do whatever I can with the basketball, you know, through the legs, the dribble, and all that kind of stuff. And going to different cities and, and, and seeing the uh, expressions on people's face as uh, they watch us play and, you know, watch how we entertain them and the things we can do with the basketball and all those things, you know, mm -hmm. that, that was quite rewarding. And, uh, you know, it's something that I will never forget, obviously. I'm sure, Mr. Hoxie, I, as I watch the documentary, which is fabulous, I would encourage our viewers to watch it. They can see it on our website. But there was this one powerful statement, and I don't remember if you said it in the interviews, but one powerful statement from a player who said, you know, we were stars when we were wearing our uniforms, but when we took that uniform off, we became black men again. How stark was the contrast between being a celebrity on the court and an oppressed race off the court? Uh, what is night and day? That would be my answer to that. 
Uh, and and I don't recall who said who made that statement uh, myself, but it was very very true. Uh, as long as we had on the red, white, and blue uniforms and out there doing tricks with the ball and so forth, you know, we were accepted. We were accepted uh, graciously, and re, you know, uh, we we were rewarded obviously with the fan of uh, appraisal and appraisal rather. But uh, it was still come in the back door. Uh, you can't eat here and so forth. One time I remember, which is stand out with me for the rest of my life, uh, we, uh, we were in Lima, Ohio, and uh, it was morning, we wanted to eat, get on the road, go to the next town. We walked into this, uh, it was like a diner, and uh, we saw this uh, state trooper sitting at the counter eating. He turned around, looked at us, so we felt fine, you know, like, hey, they're gonna serve us, no problem. Well, were we wrong? They let us sit there, the trooper took, turned around, looked back at us, continued to turn back around, continued eating his uh, food, and uh, we had to get up and leave and go somewhere else. And you can imagine getting on the road, uh, you're hungry and you have no, and you're still in Ohio. Right. That's the first thing, and you have no, you have no idea, you know, where you, where you can go and and be served and so forth. So. We met that quite often, you it, know. As it's long almost, as we had the, if we had walked in that diner with in our uniforms, they would have uh, uh, probably cleared it out for us. It would have been a whole different ball game. I was going to say it's almost unimaginable, quite but when you know the history of this country, it is imaginable. And Alan, we were talking about how amazingly, first of all, the NBA lagged behind other sports in integrating the sport, which is so amazing considering how many African Americans are on NBA teams too. And in those days, they had a hard time finding white teams that would play with them. Yes, they actually traveled with a white team that they would play in uh, many of the small towns. And uh, many of the pro teams would not play with them. And it was interesting because the dynamic between the white team and the Globe Charters was not a positive feeling because mm. the, the white team was embarrassed every single time by losing consistently to the Globe Charters. And there were other disparities between how the Harlem Globe Charters were treated and this, if you will, token white team that they traveled with. Originally, the title of the um, documentary was going to be Good Babies Don't Cry because Abe Sapistein, the owner, used to say to the black players, good babies don't cry, be happy with what you got. Mm -hmm. um, and they were treated you know, as second class citizens. They not only weren't able to eat and sleep in places with the white players, they were given less money for, for food and for stipends and salaries. Mr. Hoxie, I remember seeing the Harlem Globetrotters when I was a little girl. My dad took me to a game in Jonesboro, Arkansas. It was the first time that I had seen in person professional African-American men performing excellently, and I'll never forget that. Did you feel a pressure to represent, if you will, black folks everywhere that you went? Yes, 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 indeed, we did. Uh, we knew that we had to um, present some type of acceptable picture, you know, if you will, and uh, we tried to make sure that if there was a problem that we were not part of it and definitely did not start it. And uh, we, we, I would imagine we walked away sometimes when when uh, if the conditions were different, it would have been a different, entirely different situation. But yes, there was a there was a basic difference, uh, you know, during those days, and and uh, I, I I admire uh, I'm happy for these guys now who are playing and going to the different parts of the country and world and so forth, because they're accepted and uh, in, in a different way. Mm -hmm. But uh, we still had to go in the back door. We I... still we still had to have the thing we can't serve you thing. Right, and that's just, it's just amazing. I, I have to bring this conversation to a close, but Alan, before I let you go, when you started on this, as you already said at the top of the discussion, you had one vision and it shifted because of the realities of the time. You're a seasoned journalist. You've heard everything, you've seen everything. Was there something about this journey that surprised you as you begin to interview these players and hear their stories? Yes, I would have thought that we didn't have the issues as deeply rooted in this country. Hmm. Um, beyond this documentary of seeing Michael Brown, seeing Freddie Gray, seeing what's going on um, in this country today, shows that this guy's, the battle that these men fought 
is not over. Yes, indeed. Well, I want to thank both of you gentlemen, and just because it deserves to be said, uh, I just want to also congratulate, in addition to Alan Weiss and our founder, Nduka Obegbena, the host, Julian Phillips, the writer, Deborah Gobble, the producer, Marilou Jacob, uh, the graphics animation, Pierre Villemanet, the studio director, Larry Michaels, and the studio director, Jack Nisi. Congratulations to you all. Thanks for bringing us.